don't care what the fucking venue is. I don't care if it's Instagram, Facebook, MySpace, or, or Teletype. If there's somebody there, I'm going to be where they are. Hey, Chuck, this in the building. What's up, man? Life is good, man. Thanks for having me. You know how pumped I am I'm doing the show? My man, Taz Daddy. Yeah, yes, sir. Sir. To make millions for, for other people, I can make millions for Year in, year round, he not a rookie. He a man of many hats and different skills. Give him many struggling business and watch he make it build. Hard to believe and please check the resume. Best-selling author and showcase on Ebony. Two-time Southern Entertainment Award winner. Yo, what up? Welcome to another edition of the Business Bully Podcast. And I'm very, very excited today because this individual happens to be my gay blogger litigious spirit animal. Jason Lee is a beast, y'all, and he's getting ready to show up on the show. Not now, but right about now. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Jason Lee's in the building. What up, homie? What's going on? Man, I'm trying to be like you when I grow up. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. Thanks for having me. Hey, man, thank you so much for being here. So listen, man, I am uh, I'm extremely proud of you. Hollywood Unlocked is a phenomenal success. Um, let's talk a little bit about how meteoric the rise was, man, and what you had to go through in that process in order to make Hollywood Lo- unlock such a huge, huge brand. You know, from the outside, it looked meteoric, but it was definitely a slow climb. I've been trying to figure out the whole blogosphere, social media world for probably the last uh, 10 to 12 years. And I was getting it wrong. I made a lot of mistakes. And so, you know, finally I figured it out. You know, I really started just honing in on exactly what I was trying to accomplish, what my type of platform I was trying to build. But also from the beginning, it was focused on my end goal. When I really started taking this serious, I started looking at the type of money they were making out of Silicon Valley people that I started reading TechCrunch and researching what pop sugars and the people in my space were making. And these people were, you know, they were looking beyond making a million dollars a year. They were looking for a half a billion dollar exit, billion dollar exit. And so I started looking at the business of it all. And once I really started figuring out the intricacies of how to uh, to kind of um, build that financial roadmap to where I wanted to leave the space, uh, that's when I really knew how to start. Wow, man. So what was the biggest mistake you made early on? I think one of the biggest mistakes I learned early on, or that I made early on, was just the idea that all the celebrities I knew were going to actually support me. You know, I thought that, you know, I was going to create a platform that they could have to share their side of what was happening. You know, I built the whole model as a fan of pop culture, thinking like, hey, once Jason Lee launches something, they're going to say, you know, screw these other places, I'm going to go over there and support Jason. And that was that was a huge mistake. And so initially, my idea of how I was going to tap into all of their social power for marketing did not happen. And I had to quickly pivot and realize that I had to just be the trusted space for the community. So they knew when they came to me, whether a celebrity was there or not, it was the fact of what was actually happening with that celebrity in the life of uh, the world they live in. Right. Now, of course, you're no stranger to television, you know, while now loving hip hop, things of that nature. Um, what is it like now when people look at you and they say, oh, OK, well, Jason Lee's out here being messy. Let me try to catch him up on some shit. Oh, he's on drugs. He's high as fuck. You know, all that. like what what is that like for you? And how do you feel about being, I guess, on the other side of that while still being on? You, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I, know, I know exactly what you're saying. So you're referencing recently, I went to Mexico uh, with somebody that I'm talking to and I had an amazing time. You do not go to Mexico and pass up any of the tequila and I didn't pass any of it up, but I also had something to do for the BET weekend and I was drunk out of my fucking mind. Anybody that knows me knows I am fun to party with and I go, I go hard, but I don't touch drugs because my mother was a heroin and cocaine addict as a child and then I ended up in foster care. I wrote about this in my book, God must have forgot about me. And then later on, she ended up getting into crack. I ended up adopting my brother as a result of her relapse and not wanting him to go through the foster care system. And so I've always had this thing where I don't touch drugs. Um, I don't even smoke marijuana, uh, but I do, but I'm a heavy drinker. And that was, you know, again, in my book, I talked about how I used alcohol to really suppress a lot of the pain that I went through. And so although I don't drink like I used to, there are times where when I do drink or get drunk, I, ha- I have a good time. And I just don't happen to have to go live for the BET Awards with Safari at the same time. 
And so um, when that happened, you know, uh, and I found out, oh, Jason was white girl, white girl wasted, baby, and it was all over the internet. You know, honestly, I just, I write my second book right now where a part of that is, you know, all the energy you put out, all the press you get, it's really about how you shape and mold and control your chaos. Mm-hmm. I do a lot for the internet and, and I create the chaos and then I control it. This was something that happened where I didn't control it and I find myself on the other side of the chaos and I was just kind of, I had to take a step back to say, okay, how do I regain control of this narrative? You know, what do I need to do? And I decided, you know, all the legal ramifications, of course, all the takedown notices, the lawsuit, uh, the, uh, my show using my platform to talk about it. And ultimately I'm going to be interviewing Safari next weekend. It was one of those things where, you know, I, I can give it and I can take it. And like mm-hmm. I said recently, you know, you can say anything you want on the internet. You just can't say everything you want without a consequence. And most people don't have the resources or time to go after people, but I have all the time and all the resources. That's my favorite thing, man. Like I always tell people just as a business coach and as an entrepreneur with 13 of my own businesses, the one thing that I am is very litigious. So feel free to talk shit and feel free to catch these hands. Uh, <laughs> litigiously speaking um i want to put up a picture and i just want the first thing that comes to your mind is that fair sure (laughs) um that was a great show it was a highly entertaining show um she was a great she was not the mama was she the mama i don't know but you know i used to enjoy watching that show as a child uh you know they don't do programming like they used to bro when i saw that I literally, I, I literally spit out my Gatorade, homie. I was on the floor. Like, your level of mess is so cerebral that it's like, hold on, wait, did he? And he said, no, no, the pretty one. And that, when it, and then when it hit, I, I, bro, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Um, switching gears for a minute. I, I've written 20 books. Each one of them has been a pain in the ass. Um, how have you found the author process? I, I actually enjoy it. Um, I have a really good publisher um, who works with me, and I actually enjoy it. When I wrote my first book, I was at a point in my life where I did the love of hip hop thing. I then I went over to Wild and Out, and I felt like the audience still didn't know me, you know. And I and I did a really good job of playing this, this bad guy. Like once I figured out that people talked crazy about this person, I created so much controversy. I was like, yo, I'm gonna keep being that guy. But then you get to a point where you really want people to see your heart. And as you get older, you know that there's so much that you want to give. There's so much you want to help. You know, as a former foster kid, as somebody who has come from the dirt, I want to be able to inspire people to be able to get out here and do what I'm doing. You know what I mean? And uh, and also combating racism in media. I've been very vocal and active about that. But I think that when I wrote my first book, I wrote it because I wanted people to see that I wasn't a tree, that I had feelings, that I had, that I came from somewhere, that I've been through stuff. And I think that people look at me as you started the interview by saying your meteoric rise, they look at the success, but mm-hmm. they don't understand the struggle, the journey, the sacrifice, the losses, the no's, the you're not good enough, you're never going to make it, all the doubt, the self-doubt, the lack of confidence, the weight gain. I mean, like everything that came as a part of that journey, I was able to pour into my first book and I was so proud of that. Um, and even down to the, the point that when we shot the album, the, the uh, book cover, I brought a black t-shirt, I had a black backdrop. I said, you got five minutes and don't edit this. Take it as raw as you can. I want the emotion of what they're gonna read to be on the cover of this book. We're not going to filter me anymore. We're not gonna edit. We're not going to manipulate. They're gonna get the raw, uncut version of Jason Lee. And I think I did that. My second book now that I've gone through all the experiences in the business, people paying hackers to take my page, People, uh, you know, uh, suing me, losing money, making money, all the uh, house niggas in the culture who sell the culture, sell out the culture. I now said, I got to do a book now that tells people how I got to where I am so they can understand the business aspect of it, but then also taking it a step further as an educator and building out courses and ebooks and different tools to give young creators of color the same information that I've learned without having to go through all the pitfalls and losses that I had to endure. Mm, that's phenomenal um let's switch gears a little bit um your weight loss has been like yo crazy it's like i looked up one day and it was like somebody recast you bro like it's completely different look um let's talk about it because you had a lot of different things that happened you know on your weight loss journey so so let's get into that a little bit 
Absolutely. So um, I always wanted to see if I had abs under my fat. I didn't know if God created me with abs. I, I, I look at all the men that I've been with and I'm like, damn, y'all bodies is you know amazing because I was absolutely prejudiced in terms of the type of man that I would date. You had to have a body. And I always had this thing where I was like, yo, you got to have a banging body and I'm going to have, I got money, you got the body, you, you know, not that I'm paying for it. Let's be very clear. I'm not a paymaster before they say that. But I always said that I brought stability to the relationship, but I wanted somebody who had the flexibility and the, the, the beautiful exterior that can complement my lifestyle. If we're on a yacht, I'm going to have some dope ass Versace covering my fat up, but your ass got to be halfway naked. That was the logic. What I did realize is I was suffering from a lack of self-love, mm. you know? And when I wrote my book and started going around speaking about it and meeting with people and talking to them about my experiences, and I would see them crying or being very emotional or, you know, speaking to a Remy Ma or Tiffany Haddish who read the book and told me like, oh my God, I never even saw this for you. Um, it was those relationships that started see, making me see that I wasn't loving myself enough. So I started the process of discovering my health inside my body. I knew what the outside looked like and I knew what the effects, I knew I couldn't run upstairs. I know if a dog chased me, I'd probably get torn up. You know, I knew if someone was trying to rob me, I wasn't getting away because mm -hmm. the physicalities, but I was working out and, and eating healthier and stopped drinking, still wasn't losing weight. I did a micronutrient test to, to really look at the inside of my body, realized I had, I was pre-diabetic, I had inflammation, which was making it difficult to lose weight. I did a sleep apnea test because I kept waking up with headaches. I realized that I stopped breathing for 63 seconds. And then I weighed myself and I had weighed 322 pounds. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm so out of control that I have to take control. And so I went through the mental process of talking to a friend of mine that had the sleeve surgery. And for a year, I was really afraid to do it because I didn't want to go under anesthesia and I didn't want to have surgery. Mm -hmm. And so finally, once I did the sleep test and I stopped breathing, I was like, you know what? It's liver die at this point. And if I'm going to die, I'm going to die taking control of my life. I went and uh, had the surgery in Houston. And, you know, the first five days I lost 22 and a half pounds and it really triggered something in me to keep going. But it wasn't just the sleeve surgery that did it. It was the fact that I had to make a commitment for the first time in my life to love myself and not seek love and affection from another human being, but love myself and look at myself in the mirror every day and tell myself that. And that was the beginning of the process. So I had to change my whole life. And now I'm getting ready to embark on my fitness journey where I build out this OnlyFans body so I can whore myself out for money. I'm not mad at you. So um, do you have like, because when you have a sleeve gastrectomy, when he says a sleeve, he's talking about a gastric sleeve, which is a process where they take about 75 to 80% of the stomach out and leave you a sleeve. It's not like a bypass that just bypasses the whole thing and connects to the small intestine. Um, did you have a bunch of skin um, from losing that much weight? You know what's so crazy? Even if you look at my chin and just how, 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 you know, and I'm not being, this is me just describing my chin. Right. It's, it's chiseled. You don't see hanging fat. Right. I used to have a fat ass neck and fat ass cheeks. And I even had that fat in the back. I used to hate getting a spade and you would see that little roll. That shit annoyed the fuck out of me. I was doing all types of neck exercises, trying to build muscle back there. Let me explain something to you. Everybody wants to see what my body looks like under these clothes. And I've been posting photos in the tank top tee and underwear, showing them enough of it. I had no real loose skin. My body's not, you know, 1,000% as tight as it is it's going to be once I work out. But with, but with the fitness process, it will tighten up completely. Um, I was lucky to not have a lot of loose skin. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't have that issue. But let me tell you, I was told by my friend who did it, that somebody, that his mother had done it and she had loose skin. So before I even had the first surgery, I already had the tune-up doctor in tow and I already had them on standby. I said, once I work this body out, motherfucker, we gonna go from here to toes and make sure every single piece of my body is perfected the way that I wanted to because that's what you're here for. And so, although I, I'm not a thousand percent where I want to be, once I'm done working out, I'll probably be 98% and I'm gonna tune up that other 2%. Nice. Now, how much weight have you lost altogether? I lost 120 pounds. Wow, that's incredible, man. So, do you feel like? Do you feel the difference every single day now? I'm, I'm never winded. I can run now. Um, I, I, I can run, and although I can run now, I'm not chasing these niggas no more. Uh, my self confidence was already high, but it's just through the roof now. 
Um, I'm still very humble because I realized that it was a journey of pain to get there and it was a, and it was a process to get back. And so I'm also like learning the emotional and, 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 and mental part of the process where I have to continue to not think like that guy that was 322 pounds. And uh, my body is a born again virgin. And so I've been breaking it in um, as well. And sex is so much more exhilarating when, you know, me and my company um, share the experience. So yeah, I love it. And I can wear all the clothes now. I, I can walk in the store and buy anything off the rack. Yeah, I'm waiting for that. It's coming. One of these days. <laughs> but, one, one, but see, I already got my third book already in my mind around my fitness journey because we always say when. When is right now. We can take control whenever we want. I'm telling you, I got the best doctor in the world. Shout out to Dr. Marvin in Houston. He's phenomenal. Now yeah, that was what's up, man. So do you have, if you were to look at look back over your life, do you have any particular regrets? And if so, um, what would you do to change them or what are you doing now to change them? No, I don't have any regrets. I mean, there's moments in my career where I've done or said things that have been inappropriate. You know, recently I was in Aruba and um, I got a message that Winnie Harlow didn't want to talk to us. You know, she like refused to talk to us. Now, Winnie is somebody that I got booked on while and now she's somebody I've had dinner with in London. She's somebody I went to Beyonce concert with at uh, Coachella. She's somebody who, who I'm on her phone encouraging her when haters are coming after her. And, and I didn't understand why she didn't want to do our interview. And then I texted her, I said, yo, I thought we were cool, but it's noted. And she sent me a clip of my show where I referred to her skin disorder as uh, compared it to Roland Ray's burn mark. And yeah, it was a, it was a fucked up joke, you know, uh, but I, and I, and, and I wasn't doing it as a diss to her, but this is the same person that's had something to say about black women's hair. She's had, some, some, she's had something to say where black women have drugged me every time I post her on the page because they say she doesn't support black people. And so she said she knows where it, what it feels like to come from a place of maybe saying something you didn't mean or saying something in a way that hurt people and wanting to fix it. But because she was on the other side of it, you know, she, I guess, didn't, I mean, she didn't have the empathy for me. And she was just like, fuck it. She sent me the clip and she left it at that. I thought she was mad because her boyfriend and I don't get along because he tried to be my friend, but he was really trying to fuck India Love. I'm like, maybe he thought he was trying to get the pussy, so you was mad at me. I don't know. I haven't talked about that. But either way, I just think that, you know, celebrities need to become less sensitive to the things that impact them when they out here doing the same shit. Now, that's say going back to the original question. No, I don't regret anything because everything I've said and done has got me to where I am right now, and I will continue to soar, as I say, the king of this internet because that is what I am destined to do. And uh, I'm going to make mistakes along the way, and I don't regret them because they're all lessons. Word. Now, <clears throat> how do you feel about you know the contemporaries out here that, that don't share our skin um but profit heavily on the mess and misfortune of our people like what is your take on that do you even like look at that feel some type of way don't even acknowledge it what, what's your take on it are you talking about like the sean kings of the world the sean kings of the world i, I call them talcum x or martin luther cream i'm um, also talking about um you know folks like harvey levin at tmz who does a phenomenal job of shitting on good black people and, and getting checks for it while other black people just lie to say oh boss that's so funny um you know like how like because to me like i get pissed off at the shit and i just feel like it's ridiculous but i'm just curious as to you know how do you feel about those types the the culture vultures those who pretend like they're one of us and and those who uh, make it clear that they're not, but they're allies and they don't have an allyship bone in their body. Well, I questioned Sean King's intentions a long time ago and he blocked us on Hollywood Unlocked. Uh, I got his phone number from, uh, I think it was either Yandy or Tamika Mallory, uh, but I got his number. I did reach out to him. I tried to have a relationship with him because I thought he was using, at first I, you know, I saw the gloss everybody else he was using this platform to highlight the injustices uh, uh, happening to our people. But then as I started really paying attention, I'm like, wait a minute, you made all this money. Where's all this money going? What programs and resources are you providing for the community? What programs are available? Why are you not doing a lot of interviews with the culture so we can ask you the questions that our people want to know? Wait a minute. Wait, so you're doing all these campaigns. As soon as a black man dies, you got these email campaigns. You're racking up all. I understand data collection. I know the value that a company has once you have millions of emails. That's millions of dollars worth of data. You're using the death of black people 
repeated anger and angst of the black community to, to secure data for your business. You raise all this money and make all this money, but yet we don't know how you're spending it. So once the question started being asked of him in the press, and he started becoming defensive, and then the birth mark, the birth uh, certificate came out, that his own family said he was a white man. I said, if this is not Rachel Dozier all over again, and then I wanted to ask questions and he blocked it. That's when I said, yeah, Nick, I'm on to you. What do I think about it? I think black people have to stop thinking that white people are our saviors. I, need, I think we need to stop thinking because somebody posts a lot of dead black bodies at the hands of a, a white police officer that somehow social justice. I come from a union background. For 10 years, I led healthcare workers for uh, in the Kaiser Permanente healthcare system. One thing I know is that there are different points to get into action. There's, agita- there's information. You put the information out there. Then there's agitation. You get them riled up. And then there's action. He fails when it comes to action. There's information, there's agitation, and then there's super agitation, there's hyper agitation, and there's leaving people agitated, all the while he makes the profit. Then you got the Yandies and people telling me, please just leave him alone because he's doing good. Just because a white person shows up and says that, hey, there's dead black men laying on the street by police officers, we should be mad. Nigga, we been mad. We been got that. Martin Luther King was here. Malcolm X, you ain't, you, you ain't the token nigga of this generation for me. You're not my leader. I am my own leader. And I think that I, I get very frustrated at sometimes with social media and social movements because they collide and everybody is Malcolm X of the 2021 year. And uh, I, I I feel like we do we need to do a better job of policing our movement. We need to do a better job of policing the people that we uh, allow to speak on our behalf or speak on our topic. And if they're afraid to come and sit with us and have candid conversations, we should um, definitely evict them from the process. I'm not mad at it, brother. Um, <clears throat> is there oh, any? But let me but let me touch on Harvey Levin. Now uh-huh. Harvey Levin Harvey Levin is a different type of devil. Okay. Telepictures gave him $11 million for him to really launch and propel his business to a, a level where he can tear down the black community. But it's black people that can't wait to call and tip TMZ to get seen because black celebrities have this desire to be talked about by white press that somehow gives them validation. Um, you know, they would stray away from the shade rooms, the ball alerts, and the Hollywood unlocks of the world, but they can go over there and stuff uh, uh, Harvey Dick for some press because that's what they believe is going to propel them to superstardom. It was Queen Latifah that told me when I started Hollywood Unlocked, get the black audience, be loyal to the black audience, and then take them on a journey with you, but never turn your back on them. And I never forget that when I'm dealing with celebrities as an interviewer or when I'm dealing with the press when it comes to wanting to be a part of my process. When you reached out to interview me, I was like, hell, let's do it, because I'm all about supporting other black businesses, entrepreneurs, podcasters, bloggers, whatever, because we all need each other because on the other side of the coin is the white folks who are taken away from our culture and reporting it as news because they are the they are the validation. Mm-hmm. Bullshit. Yeah. Absolutely hate that shit. Um is there anything that somebody um would be surprised to know about you that you've never shared in public? No, I think I've shared everything. I really think I've been as transparent. The stuff that I say on my show, I think people think it's just for entertainment. But like, we could be talking about something. I'm like, yo, I gotta tell you about this STD I had. Like, it was fucked up, you know? But hey, I was able to work through it, thank you, Jesus. So I, I, I try to come from a place of being fully transparent because at the end of the day, uh, uh, I was having dinner with a friend of mine in Miami and he was telling me how he was afraid for people to know he was gay. And I said, that right there is the one thing you're giving people power over you for. Like, they know that's the thing you're trying to avoid, but they're going to try to control you. Once you put it all out there, you have all the power. Mm, You are absolutely right. Jason Lee, it's uh, been nothing short of a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much uh, for coming through. Um, I'm excited to see where you take this next journey, man. This new book I'm excited to read. Um, I loved your first book. Uh, been a huge fan of what you do, man. Congratulations on all your success. I wish you nothing but the best, man. 